GHS, can I get an MSDS that is compliant everywhere? Welcome to another installment of Nextreg on Compliance. My name is Mike Moffat. I'm the Director of Communications here at Nextreg Compliance. Often I'll get a request in from a client who will say that they, they would like me to author a, an MSDS or SDS um, into the GHS standard. I say, okay, well, that's, you know, thank you for that request. What jurisdiction do you need this GHS MSDS to be compliant in? And often they, they feel that this is a strange question. They say, well, GHS is, you know, the globally harmonized system. So shouldn't I be able to get a single MSDS or SDS that's globally compliant? That all I would have to do once I have my MSDS is translate that document into the local language and use it in that country. So if I, if I want to use this MSDS or SDS in Sweden, all I'd have to do is translate it into Swedish. I'd have to make no other changes. Sounds logical, but unfortunately GHS is not going to work that way. And I've, I'm going to identify five key reasons why GHS is not going to work that way. The first is not every country has adopted GHS yet. At, at the time of shooting this video, GHS hasn't been adopted in Canada, hasn't been adopted in the United States. This is a problem that should correct itself over time, but for the time being, you know, not everywhere has GHS. Two is that GHS uses what's known as the building blocks approach. So a country can, when adopting GHS, doesn't have to adopt the entire purple book. It can decide how much it wants to adopt, you know, which categories, how many, categ how many levels in each category, and so on. They don't have to adopt the entire thing. I like to say that GHS is a buffet. So we're seeing in a lot of jurisdictions that the Envirotox category is not being adopted. In other cases, a country might adopt, you know, three of the five levels for carcinogenicity or so on. So not everywhere is using the same uh, parts of GHS. Now, it do, I haven't seen anywhere in any of the regulations where a country, uh, a company is forbidden from using categories that don't apply in that uh, country. So you might think, well, why don't I just use the entire GHS purple book and, you know, it may be overkill in some areas, but, you know, at least I'd be able to get a globally uh, compliant document that way. Well, the problem is exactly that, that it's overkill. So let's go back to that Envirotox category. Consider a consumer product for a jurisdiction that uses GHS. You classify the product and it turns out it's in, an envirotoxin and you have to put that nasty little symbol of a dead fish on your product. Let's suppose your competitors though, instead just, just use the country level regulations, don't, you know, only what's needed, they don't adopt everything in the purple book. Well, what's going to happen is your product and your competitor's identical product are both going to be on the shelf. Your product has a picture of a dead or a symbol of a dead fish on it. Your competitor doesn't. What's going to happen is customers are going to choose the product without the dead fish logo on it. So you're going to lose sales. So from a marketing point of view, using the entire purple book when you don't need to probably doesn't make sense. Third is that even when countries adopt GHS or at least adopt some of the billing blocks of GHS, there are still other laws that you need to be in compliant with, either at the national or state level. So in Germany, we have the water regulations, California, we have Prop 65, and so on. So even if um, you, know, you, you took the position where I was just going to use the entire purple book, you would still need to make sure that your document had um, you know, the proper right to know information on it from, for the jurisdiction you're going into. So again, if you're going to be selling in California, you want to have that Prop 65 info on there, uh, which you don't need for a, a Germany or a Canada or an Argentina. Four is that when countries adopt GHS, usually in the regulations they give, they state how they want the MSDS laid out, you know, the, the whole sort of template layout. But these can differ between jurisdictions. So, you know, you get little trivial issues like, you know, in your subsections on the document, should those subsections, you know, can you just write them out? Do they have to be numbered? Uh, do they have to, instead of being numbered, be lettered A, B, C, D, E, F, and so on? These can differ between jurisdictions. So because of that, you know, st a strict translation is not going to work. Number five 
I believe is the most important and it's, it's causing a lot of headaches in our industry right now. That countries issue or regulators in a country issue their own substance classification. So in Japan we have a list, in the EU we have a list and it will say something like okay well acetone, we consider acetone to be you know class two, I, I don't know what it is, but let's say a class two carcinogen, it's this, it's that, it's that. Well, and typically you're required to use those classifications on your document. The problem is that they can differ. So Japan might categorize acetone one way, EU classifies it a different way, South Korea classifies it a third way. They don't necessarily have to agree. So this causes all kinds of problems because you're, you're required to use the national, the jurisdictional level um, classifications for the country you're operating in. So you really have to tailor your MSDS or your SDS to the local market. You simply cannot have a globally compliant GHS document. Simply in, in NextReg's view is not going to work. So I hope you find this informative. Um, in the next videos we'd like to answer some of your questions. So please send them my way to uh, info, info at nextreg.com. So thank you for listening and take care. This presentation and all the information contained herein is not intended to replace or be used in place of the judgment of a qualified regulatory compliance professional. The opinions expressed are those of NextReg compliance at the time the presentation was recorded. Regulations and interpretations of regulations can change rapidly, so please consult a qualified regulatory compliance professional before starting any project. This presentation is presented for educational purposes and is therefore supplementary and not to be considered exhaustive. NextReg Compliance, its officers, directors and employees hereby disclaim any and all responsibility for any loss, injury, damage or expense directly or indirectly arising out of or relating to use or reliance on this presentation or the material contained in this presentation.